In this insightful video, Andrew Haberman offers practical solutions to conquer procrastination and ignite our motivation. That is very hard to control the mind with the mind. And I think a simple rule that people can adopt is when your mind is not where you want it to be, look to your body. He delves into various strategies, unveiling the keys to achieving a consistently driven state. Huberman's comprehensive explanation encompasses behavioral, cognitive, nutritional, and supplementation-based approaches. It will wear your nervous system down. You will be exhausted, and you will one will eventually run aground. You'll become mentally depressed. By optimizing both baseline and peak dopamine levels, we can experience enduring motivation. And so everyone has to find where that Man. sweet spot is, that kind of, you know, on the freeway driving where it's really smooth and seamless, where you're not on the accelerator the whole time, where you're in a gear that's appropriate. And, you know, we're talking now in terms of sort of, um, you know, neuroscience lens on these things, but the key is always going to be practices. He sheds light on behavioral tools like meditation and yoga, enabling us to enhance our drive during moments of boredom. Which I know that's something we all could uh, benefit at least a little bit from, right? So Huberman warns against combining dopamine-boosting activities or substances, revealing the importance of balance. Moreover, he emphasizes cultivating a growth mindset to fuel our pursuit of goals. Those people do run the risk of burnout, although there are these people that we occasionally encounter that just seem to have boundless energy for right. everything, and they tend to get a lot more done because they have a lot more internal reward. And you'll notice they're getting rewards from all the little things. And it's 100% subjective. It's like hearing funny jokes all day long. You can just keep going. <laughs> this enlightening discourse marks the beginning of a transformative journey. Empowering us to overcome procrastination and unlock our full potential. Andrew Huberman's method for conquering procrastination aligns with the intricate role of dopamine as a hormone and a neurotransmitter. By maximizing dopamine levels through behavioral, cognitive, nutritional, and supplementation-based techniques, his approach taps into dopamine's influence on motivation, learning, and resource allocation. If we turn to the body and certain behaviors, let me talk about what those are, we are able to move ourselves along the autonomic continuum. And at that point, when we've done that successfully, and it's actually quite straightforward to do, we are able to think about things differently. We start to get a sense that the way we feel might not be the way we're going to feel forever. And it's in those shifts that we start to realize, ah, my mind actually is not my best friend at these extremes. Recent research highlights the distinction between slow and quick dopamine shifts, reflecting the balance between motivation and learning. Keeperman's emphasis on behavioral tools and the interplay between dopamine and cholinergenic interneurons resonates with these findings. Understanding dopamine's impact allows us to appreciate the effectiveness of Huberman's teachings and overcoming procrastination and fostering sustained motivation. We also know other people that they have a very hard time accessing this dopamine system and they either place it under the complete control of external things. So they're miserable until they get the payoff. And then sometimes they're even miserable, miserable yeah. then. Or they really just don't, they haven't learned the skills of how to access it. Andrew Huberman's method for overcoming procrastination intersects with the role of dopamine as a neurotransmitter that modulates the electrical activity of neurons. Neurons present in the brain and spinal cord form intricate connections throughout the body. Sensory neurons, for instance, relay information from our sensory organs to our brain, with dopamine playing a role in modulating the electrical signals involved. The five circuits in the brain that utilize dopamine as a neurotransmitter align with Huberman's approach as he explores behavioral, cognitive, nutritional, and supplementation-based techniques to optimize dopamine function. That, uh, now, there is something called um, adrenal insufficiency syndrome, which is a real medical condition where people can't actually produce enough adrenaline. Mm -hmm. But most of us have enough adrenaline in our bodies to last 200 years, two lifetimes. So you, the adrenals don't really burn out. What happens is people are so overactivated. They're in this alertness, hyper alert stress for so long that eventually they kind of crash into the over fatigue stress. By understanding the functions of these dopamine circuits, we can appreciate the significance of Huberman's teachings and cultivating sustained motivation and overcoming procrastination. Understanding the mesocortical pathways reliance on dopamine is crucial in comprehending motivation, procrastination, goal setting, and pursuit. This circuit, powered by dopamine, plays a vital role in initiating specific objectives and pursuits. Your example of craving is actually what you crave. You crave the feeling yes. of craving. 
is beautiful because it would, what it means is that you don't allow yourself to go f so far down the arc of the dopamine trajectory to get to the other source of motivation. So there are two sources of motivation as it relates to dopamine, and then we can think about tools that we could export from these that are nested in neurobiology. In the context of addiction, dopamine and the in the mesocortical circuit are intricately involved. Addiction leads to neuroplastic changes in the brain's reward, stress, and executive function systems, with dopamine being produced in the nucleus accumbens in the ventral tegmental area. By optimizing dopamine levels, Andrew Huberman's method aligns with breaking the cycle of addiction and nurturing healthy motivation, enabling individuals to overcome procrastination and actively pursue their goals. First is to do what you do, which is to be able to sense the craving as its own form of pleasure. This has kind of remnants of Carol Dweck's growth mindset that you eventually develop a, a pleasure in the seeking and the striving, has a, you know, uh, has flavors of a Gog David Goggins type yeah. approach where, where it seems like he gets pleasure from the friction itself. And so there are elements of that. You seem to have that as well. But if you can start to identify the craving as its own internally released drug, this thing, dopamine, that is a source of motivation, then what you realize is that capturing the reward is wonderful, but attaching dopamine to the reward is actually a little bit dangerous. Attaching, yeah, this, this is celebrating so the win, celebrating the win more than the pursuit. It actually sets you up for failure in the future, and oh so this God. gets us right into something called dopamine reward prediction error. And reward prediction error is basically if you expect something to be really great, and then it's not quite that great, your dopamine baseline lowers. And now understanding what we know about dopamine, that means that not only did you you feel as if you lost because it wasn't as much a celebration as you thought it would be. But it also means that you're starting from a lower place, meaning you are less motivated. Dopamine release in the frontal brain influences the levels of dopamine, resulting in peaks or troughs that can enhance or decrease actions. These peaks refer to the increases above the baseline, while troughs represent decreases below that baseline. So. Various factors can trigger dopamine peaks, including substances, chemicals, food, and behaviors. The dopamine system is really important to understand. So we've talked about norepinephrine kind of gets you going. Acetylcholine is the spotlight of attention. The dopamine system is mother nature's hardwired ancient system in all animals, including humans, to put us on the right path. Now, it's a lot of people talk about dopamine as this thing that you get when you publish the book or when you get the book deal or, when something wonderful happens, like your child's born. And that's true. But dopamine's main role is to be released anytime you achieve a milestone or you think you're on the right path. And when the dopamine system is tethered to a particular pattern of focus, remember duration, path, and outcome. So it's like, okay, you sit down, maybe you don't get much text out, but then the next day you get 800 words of really solid text and you feel good, you're like I'm, I'm into this. What does that dopamine system do? The dopamine system, takes the norepinephrine, which is normally rate limiting, like at some point, there's so much norepinephrine that you quit, and we can talk about mm -hmm. that. It's actually the, the substrate for quitting. Dopamine can push that noradrenaline back down, that adrenaline back down, and give you more room, more space to do duration path and outcome work, highly focused work. Mm -hmm. And I'm making duration path outcome synonymous with highly focused work. Why would this happen? So let's think about an animal. Let's think about a deer that wakes up and is thirsty and it's wandering out looking for water. That animal needs water. It doesn't know that it needs water. It experiences agitation, the same way that a baby feels agitation when it wants food, but it doesn't know it needs food. Mm -hmm. It just feels agitation and cries and a caretaker comes, hopefully. That deer is now foraging for something that it needs. And let's say it smells water, because deer can actually do that, and arrives at a stream and takes a sip of water. There's dopamine release then that puts it on a path to maybe a larger lake or something of that sort, or to be able to go achieve food. So when we are on the right path and we hit a milestone, dopamine is released, and it tends to tighten our focus more for that activity. The baseline dopamine concentration, also known as the dopamine reservoir, determines the magnitude of these peaks. An analogy can be drawn to a wave pool, where small waves maintain the baseline while larger waves, big peaks, can cause the water or dopamine to splash out of the pool, leading to baseline drops. This analogy kind of helps to illustrate the dynamic nature of dopamine function, I would hope, at least to you. So anyways, that's just the tip of the iceberg. 
buckle up, buttercup. You can reframe the emotional component. You can unweight the emotional load. And this is why I think that sleep is so foundational. The great work of Matt Walker and um, and the Stanford folks at the Stanford Sleep Clinic, have, you know, and, and many others, of course, there are many great sleep scientists out there, have really unpacked this in, incredible period of our life we call sleep. What has not happened yet, and what is uh, and something that's very important to me and my lab's mission and, and many other labs also is, we need a taxonomy, a naming system for waking states. You know, for sleep, we have REM and slow wave sleep. We know what the early night is for. We know what the second half of the night is for. We go through our waking life talking about things like happiness, sadness, depression, stress, anxiety, and fear. But it's, it's all pretty vague. And I think one of the exciting things that's going to happen in the next 10 years or so, hopefully sooner, is that we're really going to start to understand what is creative work? What is focus? What is conversation? What is pair what is bonding you know and really understand those things at a biological and psychological level to the point where we can also um i don't really like the word hack but that we will be able to uh pull apart the different components and really understand you know maybe we should i'm making this up so please don't take this as a recommendation but maybe we should all be focused on uh activities that increase our uh you know, acetylcholine early in the day, and then we should gradually be turning that off. You know, we all hear don't drink caffeine past 4 p.m., you know, and messes with your sleep. Well, maybe there are things that we should be doing, you know, for our waking states. And so one of the things that excites me now is that um, because of the unfortunate events of 2020, most people now are tuned into the fact that they have a brain and a body. They're very much connected. Pursuit is very taxing. And the reason is that there's a biochemical reason for this is it's like wandering in the desert, not knowing if there's water at all. That's really depleting. I mean, epinephrine is in the brain and it's a, it's chemical equivalent in the body is adrenaline. Those are the same thing. And if you're constantly in pursuit, right? You're just pursuing external goals, ex external goals, external goals. It will wear your nervous system down. You will be exhausted and you will, one will eventually run aground. You'll become mentally depressed. The key is to figure out what are the rewards that you can acquire along the way internally. Remember, it's subjective. There can also be external rewards because many things have milestones, you know, a series A or a series B for a company, then the IPO yeah. right, later. Reaching a million or, users or doing yeah, this, yeah. That we have engagements before we have weddings typically, right? Yeah. Um, there are those rare instances where people just <laughs> go and get married, but typically there's a lot of buildup that is designed, you know, that fortunately, you know, provides these uh, reward mechanisms. So the, the key thing is that you can't just be all gas pedal all the time without rewarding yourself. However, the reward that dopamine is so powerful because it actually, as I mentioned before, it actually is the chemical substrate for epinephrine. It creates a reservoir of more energy. Mm. And again, I'm not talking about caloric energy or glycogen. Mind energy. It, it's, it's, it's mental energy. It's the, it's the desire to push on. I think that understanding that pain and pleasure are in this really dynamic balance can also help us which in the following way. Any pain that you feel, the longer day, the less sleep, the, the kind of agony that things aren't working, that power outlet doesn't work, or the internet is slow, whatever it is, the amount of pleasure that you will eventually experience is directly rela related, excuse me, to how much pain you experience. So we know this from actually what nowadays would be considered quite barbaric and unethical experiments where they would give people electrical shocks and they would measure their response. And then they'd say, we're going to increase it. We're going to increase it. Eventually they get to the point where a slight a shock that was previously very painful actually evokes a sense of pleasure. <laughs> Now you couldn't do these experiments anymore. These are not the experiments I do in my lab. These are older experiments. But for instance, uh, and this has been discussed in scientific research papers, uh, giving somebody a, like a, a 10 minute ice bath, for instance, or even a three minute ice bath, or a one minute ice bath is quite painful. But there was a study from the University of Prague, a European Journal of Physiology showed that after a painful ice bath stimulus, the amount of dopamine release goes up for two and a half hours to 250% above baseline. And that's not because the ice bath itself evokes dopamine release. A lot of people think, oh, cold water evokes dopamine release. No, pain <laughs> evokes dopamine release after the pain is over. 
Yesterday I tweaked my back because I do this stupid thing every few years, the same stupid thing, and it, it's really painful. And then you just remember all the ways in which you can't move around. I was like standing up this morning, I'm like, ah, uh, and just walking is so painful. As the pain has started to dissipate, you get a little bit of a high, right? You get a little bit of a euphoria, that's dopamine, because of the, the degree of pain that you experienced previously predicts how much pleasure. So when you start a company down in the dregs and you're shoveling again, that's beautiful because that means that the win that you achieve is going to be as good or greater than the one you had previously, in your case with Quest. There's a mechanism associated with that that makes our internal world measure time differently. What happens under those conditions is you feel like the external world is moving very slowly. Mm. I think I might have mentioned this in the, our previous meeting, yeah. but when you're really stressed on the hyper alert side, it seems like the world is going very slowly. You're gonna, just knowing that, and knowing that it's likely that you're gonna feel impatient and if the world is moving much too slow. And then when we are fatigued, it seems like the world is going really fast, okay? And so for people who are exhausted, everything feels overwhelming. Now, of course, the rate that things are actually moving in the world is the same, but the perception is that it's just too much and we can't cope. So. We talked about a tool to calm oneself. Mm -hmm. The reason I like the physiological side is we, we are all equipped with the pathway. If people wanna know if there's some medically oriented folks out there, or if you wanna teach this to other folks, there's a nerve called the phrenic nerve, P-H-R-E-N-I-C, that goes from the brain down to the diaphragm that controls that and then controls the lungs. Mm. And so when you decide, okay, I'm gonna use the side, the physiological side to calm myself, in a way you're engaging top-down control because you're, you're taking control of your internal landscape mm -hmm. rather than trying to take control of your thinking, which is very hard. So when it is very hard to control the mind with the mind, and I think a simple rule that people can adopt is when your mind is not where you want it to be, look to your body. Use the body to shift the mind. It's a simple equation it's sometimes hard to do because thoughts can be so all-encompassing but when your mind is not where you want it to be if you don't feel as happy or you're obsessing you need to go to a mechanical system in the body because if you do that you'll shift the chemicals that are released in your brain in a way that will allow you to regain control of the steering wheel so there are a couple things that can do that immediately um, the most basic one and the simplest one is going to be with respiration, with breathing. So breathing and the neurons that control breathing are so interesting because they are constantly working. They work reflexively all the time. They're working right now. If you're alive and you're listening to this, you, they're working. But unlike a lot of aspects of our brain-body connection, we can grab a hold of it immediately and, and start tinkering with it. Like I can't say right now, hey, start digesting faster, Andrew, you know, or tell my intestines, hey, you know, slow down digestion, or I can't make my heart rate speed up just by telling it to, but I can slow down or speed up my breathing if I want to. So it lies at this bridge between the conscious and the unconscious mind. And I don't say this from any point or stance of philosophy, this is physiology. So if your mind is not where you want it to be, whether or not you're trying to sleep or work or focus or anything, I'm a big fan of this physiological sigh, which was discovered by physiologists in the 1930s. It's a double inhale through the nose and a long exhale that follows. The exhale can be done through the mouth or through the nose. If you're one of these people who can't breathe through your nose, you could do this all through your mouth. So it's just an inhale and then inhale again, even if you're just sneaking in a little bit more air and then long exhale. The physiological side is known to physiologists and neuroscientists as a way to offload a lot of what's called carbon dioxide and it immediately produces a, a heightened sense of calm or a reduced sense of stress and alertness.